Uh, but thanks, it's my honour to be here. I really do appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Um, I am going to speak today about the issue of uh, basic freedoms, religious freedom, especially uh, the situation in Australia and who knows perhaps based on some things I was hearing yesterday uh, with a group of lawyers at Bob's office uh, some things that are emerging here in New Zealand what to expect. Um, there is something you should know though uh, and you should know that I was named after a preacher and uh, that'll explain a lot of what's about to happen. Um, I do tend to get into the preaching side of things sometimes, so bear with me. And also, I guess, as well as the Managing Director of the Australian Christian Lobby, uh, I'm quite open about my presuppositions about the foundations of what I believe. Uh, I think there's, uh, my dad used to tell a story of a little boy at the beach, and the boy used to run out to the ocean, and he'd fill up his bucket with some water, and he'd come charging back up the beach, and he'd yell out, hey, mummy, look, I've got the ocean in my bucket. And uh, I think sometimes we run the risk of thinking we've got the ocean in our bucket, when we talk about some of these overhangs of Christian ideas, overhangs of Judeo-Christian heritage, protection of the family, love of freedom, etc. Uh, I'm not just interested in talking about that, I'm actually interested as well in talking about the vast ocean of truth that lies behind it, uh, because I do believe that none of this makes sense without truth, truth makes no sense without God, God makes no sense without the revelation he's made to us in Jesus Christ. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you today about freedoms from an unashamedly Christian point of view. Um, and the reason that I am so interested in this question of governance, the reason I'm so interested uh, in uh, what the government is doing in my country and your country is because uh, if you read in Romans 13, Paul says something very interesting. He said, government is what God has appointed. He says, governing authority comes from God. There's no authority except that which God has given. Whoever resists the authorities resists God's appointment. Uh, I had someone come up to me after a conference once and they proudly announced that they were a Christian anarchist. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, well, uh, I don't think that option is open to you uh, because God said he invented the government for our good, right? It's supposed to be there. It's part of the system. Uh, but he goes on to say... You know, it's not just that it's part of the system that's intended for this world, but he mentions that authority, governing authority, actually rightly belongs to God. It's an interesting point. I used to be a corporate lawyer in a big firm uh, in Brisbane, and we'd often come across a structure called uh, a trust, and most of you will know what that is. But especially in a situation where a very wealthy individual would have an overflow of wealth and assets, um, lots and lots of money, too much money to manage. Um, Oh, if that were only me. And uh, they would put some of this money aside into a structure called a trust, and they would appoint a trustee who would look after the wealth and those assets and do so in the interests, the best interests of the true owner, the rich guy. And, uh, you know, if they breach those fiduciary obligations, then they're in a lot of legal trouble. But I see the Bible talk a lot about governing authority like that. It's like God has all authority. Christ has been given all authority. But he's given some of that authority on trust to some called governing authority here in this world. And when they have that governing authority, and that might be a prime minister, it might be a member of parliament, it might be a judge, it might be a magistrate, it might be a public servant, it might be a police officer who carry this species of authority, which we discover belongs to God. Remember Jesus said to Pilate, when Pilate said, do you not know I have authority over you? And what did Jesus say? He said, you have no authority at all, unless it was given to you from above. The authority belongs to God. And Paul goes on to say in Romans 13, that those who bear that authority, therefore, are rightly called ministers of God and servants of God. It's a very high calling. It's a very serious obligation. Uh, I grew up in a church tradition where politics was frowned upon. Uh, I used to walk around as a kid and proudly announce that I was going to be Prime Minister one day. Uh, and uh, my dad had to take me aside and say, listen, don't say that. Not just because it's arrogant, but because uh, <laughs> I'm falling out of favour with the other church members when you go around and say that. Uh, but then I read Romans 13 one day and I thought, well, hang on a minute. Who can be a minister and a servant of God? 
uh, if not a Christian person. Uh, you know, a minister is someone who rightly represents someone else's interests. A servant is somebody who serves under the authority of someone else. Whose authority? God's authority. He owns the authority. He owns the authority that, that you're bearing. And so there's a ministry to which the governing authorities are called. And the question we ask then is, well, what's the ministry? What's the interest that they're to represent? What's the service that they're to undertake? Um, and it's interesting. I actually think that the Bible is clear on this from start to finish, and it's something that just makes intrinsic sense. So even if you're not a Christian, this will make intrinsic sense. Uh, but uh, it all starts in the Old Testament, carries into the New, and it makes sense in the modern day. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, um, we used to go to this nursing home in Brisbane. My dad was a medical doctor, and he used to give free care to uh, all the residents of this nursing home. They were all Christian people. Uh, but he had a lot of kids, and most of them were talented. I was the youngest, and I wasn't, but I had very musically talented siblings who were older than me, especially my sisters. And so what he'd do was he'd do all the medical care, and then he'd call everyone into the common room, and uh, he'd put on a little show with his, uh, with his family. And they'd get up and sing and whatnot. And uh, what I had to do, though, was... Uh, something else. I'd got a bit of an obsession as a young kid with the kings of the Old Testament and so I memorized the biography of every king from Saul to Zedekiah, North and South Kingdoms. I have no idea uh, what was going on but I did and uh, I used to stand up on a chair with a little bow tie on and give a sermon on a king from the Old Testament and sit down. They thought it was delightful, I was very small and uh, you know you look at those things and you think, well, why on earth was that in my life? Um, but you know, nothing you do is ever wasted. Uh, and it occurred to me one day, and I was, as I was thinking about this subject, it didn't matter, you know, of all of those kings. It didn't matter how long they reigned for, it didn't matter, what, matter whether it was a Manasseh for 55 years or a Hezekiah for 52 years. It didn't matter the political complexities of their reign, uh, you know, how many alliances they entered into with Assyria or Egypt or what battlefront vi victories they won. Uh, it didn't matter, you know, what kind of economic reforms that they did. It didn't matter, you know, how, how much treachery there was or how much peace there was. There was really one thing that mattered in every single one of those biographies. And I used to skip to this line that appeared time and time again to cheat and find out what kind of guy this was. And this line that appeared time and time again was simply this. It said, he did that which was right in the sight of God all the days of his life and died, or he did that which was evil in the sight of God all the days of his life and he died. And you know, it turns out that that is perhaps a, the pithiest summary of the ministry to which that man was called before God as someone who wielded governing authority in a big way. Right? Wrong. Solomon, right, was the wisest man in the business of government, other than Jesus, who is in the business of government. Um, and he, he prayed for wisdom, and we all know that he did that. But we forget that he actually not only, in that, in that passage in 1 Kings 3, it not only says that he prayed for wisdom, it says why he prayed for wisdom. And he says, grant your servant wisdom that I might discern between that which is right and that which is wrong. Very simple prayer, very simple purpose. Why would he care about right and wrong? Why would God put on the headstone of every king after 55 years of com complex reign this simple thing, he did that which was right, he did that which was wrong. Well, the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, what does it say? Governors as sent by God to punish those who do evil and reward those who do good. Romans 13, what does it say? He is God's servant for your good, attending to this very thing, what? Punishing the wrongdoer. Uh, he is God's minister for what? To reward the one who does good. And so from start to finish, and you see even when it talks about Jesus' future kingdom, it says a scepter of righteousness will be a scepter of his kingdom. And the point is this, the overwhelming concern here is that governments bear a moral compass. That governments understand intrinsically what is right and what is wrong. And they treat right as right and wrong as wrong. And that the laws that governments pass suppress that which is wrong, and promote that which is right. Now, that's in the world of the Bible, but it's also just a statement of fact and reality. Uh, you know, Sir William Blackstone, one of the greatest English common lawyers, 
first guy to really systematize the English common law and give lectures on it. Uh, when you go to university and study law, you might read a bit of Blackstone, but for some reason you never read the first few chapters of his works on the common law, and that's because of how unbelievably biblically Christian they are. Um, and I did read those first few chapters quite by accident one day, uh, and was quite shocked at what I found. But Sir William Blackstone makes this point. He says, a law in a common law nation like New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom, a law is a rule of right conduct. That's just a statement of fact. The law tells us what is right and what is wrong in a community. And when governments pass laws, they are actually creating a framework of what is right and what is wrong. You know, it's an old-fashioned word, it's a biblical word to talk of righteousness, but that's the business that governments are involved in and they cannot easily escape from it. And it matters, you know, it matters that that moral compass which governments have, whether they like it or not, it matters that that is well calibrated, it matters that that is uh, actually punishing wrongdoers and actually rewarding those who do good. It matters that there is a restraint on, you know, as Christian, Christian people know this, human beings are basically corrupt, not basically good, but basically corrupt. And that manifests itself in societies throughout the ages. Things go wrong. Societies ultimately stuff up and fall apart. Why? Well, because people are corrupt. And when they get together, some of that corruption manifests itself and eventually it all goes down the, you know, not me, but all them, right? They're, they're not, not me. All those other people in the society, right? There's a corruption there and it's government's responsibility to make sure that that corruption is held at bay. To make sure that there is an authority in the land to, it, to say, no, no, that's wrong and to keep it down. Now, that's the, obviously the ideal. And by the way, there's a great principle in that. I mean, uh, and this is a principle for life, uh, which is, you know, when you get that right, most other things fall into place. Uh, our government at the moment, we've just had this big Israel Folau saga over the last few weeks and it's been a, a consuming concern of mine uh, to uh, get this into the public square to raise the issue of religious freedom, um, to raise the issue of basic freedoms in Australia and uh, there's been many Israel Folau's in Australia, about 70 in fact, but they haven't been famous enough for the media to take any notice uh, and so when Israel Folau comes along I'm thinking well this is it, this is the chance we can make this, this guy is actually already famous and we can raise his story and we can get it into the public square. And that's exactly what we did. And the government has promised that they will introduce new religious freedom legislation in this term of parliament. And this week is the first sitting week of parliament. And I'm thinking, this is awesome. It's like on a silver platter for the government to just walk in and say, yeah, look at that massive outpouring of support for Israel Folau. By the way, we think that was overkill as well and we're just going to make sure that people like him aren't bullied in the future, right? There would barely be a whimper of objection from the vast majority of the population. Fine, there'd be political types and media types that have a, you know, a brain fuse, but most people wouldn't mind. And I thought, great, we've set this up brilliantly. What do they do? First week back in Parliament, tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts. I'm thinking, oh man, all for what? And the reason is that the usual political line uh, in our countries is it's the economy stupid. And every election you will find that the narrative is always about who has the deepest tax cut, who has the most generous welfare program. You know, in Australia, who's going to get the fattest Centrelink checks? Uh, when they go down to the welfare office. Which motorway is going to get the biggest upgrade? How cheap are your school fees? That's the sort of thing with which politics in the day-to-day -day is concerned in New Zealand, in Australia. But I say there's something more fundamental than any of that. And the more fundamental thing is actually this moral compass. This matters first, because when this falls apart, nothing else really continues to work. That's the story of societies throughout the ages. Uh, that's actually the story of the Bible. Romans 1, what does it say? The first thing that goes wrong is ungodliness and unrighteousness. In other words, the moral compass is stuffed up. Where does that lead? Well, everything just begins to slowly fray. If the family then starts to fall apart, well, what's going to happen? Well, young people are going to start to fall apart. 
If young people fall apart, what happens? Well, the economy falls apart because they're not productive, and so on and so on and so on. There's something that matters as primary, and that's why we concern ourselves, and I think Bob concerns himself and I concern myself, with these issues that politicians want to ignore, things like the dignity of life, things like the integrity of the family, things like freedom to speak the truth without fear. These are intrinsically moral issues, and they really matter. But here's the thing. Um, in every society, this goes wrong, either a little bit or a lot. Um, and I think that that's something that's also comprehended in the Bible, because there is a verse in Isaiah 5.20, which I like to quote, uh, which says, "'Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness, and bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter.'" In other words, what's the problem? By the way, read Isaiah sometimes, could have been written yesterday. It's an amazing analysis of a culture that's sort of in trouble. Um, and the issue here is a reversal, a polarization of the moral compass, people mixing up good and evil, mixing up right and wrong. And that is a terrible situation to be in. Um, and you know, I've been in this policy advocacy space for a few years, so I started my role um, in a political sort of role. I was chief of staff to my predecessor, then we did the Human Rights Law Alliance, the legal work, then I came back to ACL to take on this job. It was 2014, so it was about uh, five years ago. And you know, at, at its root, I like to understand things by their organising principles, at their very root, their basis. Uh, there's lots of things that are changing over those five years, lots of things that are changing in Australia over the last decade, last 20 years. But, you know, if I could really capture it at its root in a nutshell, it seems to me that over the last five years what's happened is there's been a train parked at a station with sort of like Romans 13 over the top of it. And the train is now departed and is travelling down the train tracks towards a station that's sort of got Isaiah 520 over the top of it. I see a new morality coming in. I see a new understanding of right and wrong coming in. And that, I think, is a catastrophic situation for a society to be in. And I say that because of what I've seen. I say that by experience. Um, do you know, when we started the Human Rights Law Alliance in May 2016, uh, it was myself and there was a barrister from Adelaide uh, and uh, we, we, we got cracking with this thing. We set up this entity and we said, well, what are we going to do? We're going to help Christians who get in trouble with the law for living out their faith. And I said to him, this is the first venture I've been involved in. I've been involved in a few different things. I said, the first one I've been involved in where actually the business plan is for it to fail because we don't want this to be a need. We don't want people to get in trouble with the law for expressing their faith, for free speech and all these issues. Um, we want to be able to pack up our bags and say, well, that didn't work, good. Unfortunately, it was only a couple of weeks and the first phone call came in and the first phone call was from a young fellow called Joshua. Um, and Joshua uh, is a guy um, at a university in South Australia and Joshua uh, told this story or someone else told the story on his behalf of him effectively being in church one weekend and he heard his pastor talking about being salt and light uh, and how important that was uh, in your different context to you know be a good witness to your faith and so Joshua got thinking and he thought you know that I could do better at that I could do better at that at university and he decided something he would do would be to actually pray for friends of his at, uh, you know, uh, when the opportunity presented itself. And so he was doing a group assignment with this girl uh, in, in the library one evening and uh, she started to disclose to him that she was struggling with anxiety and that she was on medication and all this kind of stuff. And Joshua thought, aha, opportunity strikes. Uh, and so he said, uh, look, he said, oh, has she not really sympathised with your circumstances, talked to her for a while and they said, look, I'd be happy to pray for you too, you know, I'm a Christian and, um, you know, I think God can help us in these situations and, and she was like, yeah, no worries, whatever, so he prayed for her and then she says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist myself but I really appreciate um, that you showed that kind of care and, you know, thanks very much and all done, job done, that was it, they kept talking and then he went home. You know, it was a little while after that that uh, Joshua was called in, it was only a couple of days, to the university, got an email saying, you need to come in for a meeting. And he thought, what on earth could this be about? Went in, sat down. The university administrator said to him, look, we've received complaints about you. 
uh, making students feel unsafe on campus uh, because uh, you're praying for them. Uh, and uh, Joshua, this is unbelievable, was suspended from the university for a minimum of six months pending review. Uh, he, was, he, had, he had disciplinary action recorded on his academic transcript. He was told that he would be enrolled in fortnightly counselling classes so that he could learn how to interact with his peers in a way that doesn't make them feel unsafe. And he was told that his image, his photograph, was given to campus security so that if he returned to campus at the period of his suspension, he would be removed. And when the suspension is lifted, the only place he'll be able to express his faith is within the confines of a private group designated for such purposes on campus. Now... I got this call and I thought, rubbish, that didn't happen. There's something more to this story. Um, there's no more to that story. Um, I've actually travelled with Joshua a little bit, he's a young guy, 22 now, I think, um, and, uh, and we do speak at different events um, and he tells his story. There's nothing more to it than that. He was complained about on the basis of a prayer and they said, look, we've heard reports you might have done this to others and you have to stop. Incredible example of bureaucratic overreach in a university, making an example out of a guy who basically has no defence for himself. But you know, it so continued from there. Uh, it wasn't long afterwards that uh, we got in touch with a fellow uh, who was the general manager of a digital services agency, that is sort of website, search engine optimization, all this kind of stuff, social media. Uh, and this guy, um, he was the general manager of this firm. He'd built it up from three or four staff to about 25. Uh, and uh, he was challenged one day in a staff meeting and he was challenged by a staff member as to what his opinion was on the safe schools program because it was very much in the media at that time that there was this program which was all about gender bending for children uh, in, in Australian schools. It was going to become compulsory in the state of Victoria which we call the People's Republic of Victoria uh, and uh, most of these cases do come from Victoria by the way. Um, and and he, he was challenged about what he thought about it and uh, he answered very diplomatically. He said, look, he said, um, he said I don't agree with it. Uh, the content is, uh, is inconsistent with my beliefs. He said, I'm a Christian and I believe the best thing we can do is live our lives in the bodies that God gave us. And if it was at my kids' school, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. He said, but I just want to say this. He said, I want to say that this organisation doesn't have a political belief. And so therefore, we all do differ in what we believe about these things. He said, I wouldn't wear one of our T-shirts to a pro-life rally because I know that a lot of you aren't pro-life, just like I wouldn't expect you to wear one of our T-shirts to uh, a safe schools rally because there was actually one in the city that afternoon uh, because I don't, believe, I don't support safe schools, right? Job done, thought he did well. Do you know something? He got a phone call from the board 48 hours later and he was summarily dismissed, fired from his job because he had created, in their words, again, same language, an unsafe workplace environment. Unbelievable. And you get these phone calls from people who are in real trouble. I mean, he's just lost a six-figure income. He's got three kids and a family. It's not a pleasant place to be. All because he was asked to give an answer on this issue. Do you know, these sorts of cases have spread all across Australia. I could tell you of many people who have been fired, faced disciplinary review, had professional accreditations revoked. It's endless. Um, there's a lady called Patricia Wirakoon. Some of you may have heard of her. Uh, she's based in Sydney. She's a medical doctor. She has particular expertise on the areas of gender and sexuality. She's a strong Christian. You can imagine she's in high demand at the moment with that level, that area of expertise. I mean, a lot of expertise. And she goes to Christian schools and speaks often and she does talks and so on. She did a Christian talk at a Christian school on the issue of gender and sexuality. Very nice talk. And she always closes it out with a Christian message of, you know, salvation in Christ for all, you know, no matter who you are sort of thing. And, and she did this lovely talk and uh, it was posted online by the school and activists saw it and a whole bunch of things followed. Firstly, he decided that he'd stalk her and he did for some months. Uh, ended up assaulting her in the shops across the road from her house. Uh, and that's when she called and we got involved with the police and so on. But also, he reported her to a professional body with which she had an accreditation and reported her to a major university where she had an affiliated status. She lost that professional accreditation because of the talk. They said that she was not a fit and proper person to hold it, gone. The university 
we got some heavy hitting legal support to go with her. Uh, we said, oh, tell the university you want to bring a support person. And she showed up with a former federal court judge. So that helped. And, uh, <laughs> and she sat down and had this conversation with the university. And at the end of a long and protracted series of uh, mediations and so on, the university said, you can keep your affiliated status, but don't do it again. Uh, now, bless Patricia, she's done it again. And uh, she's not going to stop. Uh, but so far, so good. Uh, we had a case in Perth, Western Australia, a Christian couple, uh, and they applied to become foster parents, and they wanted to be foster parents of children under the age of six. Um, and they went through all of the assessment criteria over a couple of weeks, had meetings and workshops, and the agency people came to their house and so on. I've read all the reports. They passed. There was not a black, not even the beginnings of a black mark against their name. There wasn't even a smudge of the pen. It was perfect. They passed everything. Their rapport was high and so on and so on. And they, were, they were expecting to get into the foster parenting system any day. Then the agency came back to them and said, look, uh, we want you to do one more workshop uh, and it, uh, you need to come back into the agency to do it. Oh, no worries, off they went. They arrived and it was a SOGI workshop, S-O-G-I, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity. And uh, they sat down and thought, well, what's this? And it quizzed them on all of their beliefs about issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. It had things in there like, how, do, you know, two men, how does two men kissing make you feel? Uh, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, what do you believe about you know, same-sex marriage? Uh, and so on and so on. What would you do if your child at the tender age of five decided to gender transition? Uh, and they had to fill out all this stuff. And I read what they filled out, and I've got to say, I couldn't have done it any better, in the sense that they, they, they walked that line of conviction and con compassion and, and, and held to it. And they said during this workshop, they said to the agency, We've asked to foster kids under the age of six because their oldest was six and they thought that would be a, you know, a, good, a good bar to set. Uh, this isn't relevant. But they still had to fill it out. No, no, this is part of the process, no worries. It was only a couple of days later they got a decision notice in the mail and note the language that said they had failed the assessment criteria of making a safe home environment for children. And it was clearly stated in that decision notice that that had been taken after they had completed that workshop. That case is currently at the State Administrative Tribunal uh, because they've taken it up. Uh, and we are getting more and more people in Australia, by the way, taking up these causes because they see the importance of it to the broader narrative. And I understand, I was talking to some people yesterday, apparently the New Zealand psyche is a bit more sort of lie down and let it happen. Uh, but uh, in Australia, people are a little bit more, are getting a little bit stronger because they see what's going on and they see that their case can help others. Really concerning one also out of Perth is the case of a photographer called Jason Tay. Jason uh, is a highly regarded photographer. He's won a great many prizes for his work. Uh, really, really amazing stuff. And he's a wedding photographer. And he was contacted one day by an old school friend. And the old school friend uh, said to him, would you take photos of my family? by Facebook and he said yeah sure I don't usually do family shots but you're an old school friend why not whatever let's do it uh, and said yes anyway he then went and checked her Facebook profile and he realized by looking at her Facebook profile that she was in a lesbian family arrangement uh, with children and uh, for Jason that didn't mean that he wouldn't take the pictures or anything like that he, he just noticed it and he's a very earnest kind of a guy Jason and um, perhaps to a fault uh, and so what Jason did was he did a very very nice thing and the very, very nice thing that he did was he contacted this friend because he was concerned that maybe she would have a problem with the fact that he was a Christian and had a conflict of belief. And so he sent her a lovely note just saying, you know, hey, so-and-so, you know, really lovely to catch up with you and connect the other day. I wanted to let you know regarding the photo shoot that, you know, so on and so on, explained himself, uh, and then said, I'm really happy to take your pictures. I don't, have, I don't have an issue at all. I think it'll be great. But I wanted you to know in case you decide you'd like someone else and if you did I wouldn't mind but otherwise I'm here right very kind thing to do you know uh, and uh, she sued him 
and uh, she just turned around and took him to the State Administrative Tribunal under the Anti-Discrimination Act. And uh, under that, what she argued was that he, imp he had imposed a condition on the provision of a service that he would not have imposed but for her sexual orientation uh, and family status. Um, now, what happened there was that Jason didn't actually go to do anything of a discriminatory nature. He wasn't going to say, no, I won't take the pictures or... You know, there's nothing like that. What he did was he found himself in legal processes needing representation for the mere statement of his beliefs. That's all he did. And he went into the Equal Opportunity Commission and the commissioner said overtly and clearly, she, she, she made it clear that she thought that this was an excellent case and that she would be assisting uh, this couple with the case and backing them all the way. Now, these sorts of cases are getting more and more common where it's, it's no longer Israel Folau putting a slightly inflammatory post up on Instagram. No, it actually moved then to many, many cases of people being actively challenged about what they believed, giving an answer when asked and then falling foul of the law. Now it's moved to people who merely make statements of belief or even worse, the case of White Magazine in Newcastle. White Magazine's a wedding magazine. It's very, very successful. It has a very wide distribution. One of the, one of the top wedding magazines in Australia with some international distribution as well. And White Magazine is run by a Christian couple. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were some people, some activists, who had been looking at White Magazine for a few months and same-sex marriage was legislated in Australia at the start of 2017 and it was about six months after that that an activist posted on social media, hey, I've noticed something. White Magazine are yet to run a same-sex wedding. Do you think they're bigots? The question was out there. And then all of a sudden, all these activists started to rally around that question and started sending messages to White Magazine. Now, here's the thing. The couple who owned White Magazine actually hadn't made up their mind on the issue. That's where they were. They simply didn't know, and so they hadn't done anything about it yet. And so they didn't answer these messages because they weren't quite sure what to say and they didn't have any support at the time. Then those messages started to take on a very nasty flavour. Uh, there were death threats that came through. Um, there were all sorts of horrific and specific things said to them. Uh, and then all of a sudden, these stories started to pop up in the mainstream media, which only really added fuel to the fire. And they started to feel deeply unsafe and desperately uh, under attack. But then, of course, um, these activists started to think, well, how else can we take these people down? And they started contacting the advertisers and the sponsors of the magazine. And when they did that, all of the advertisers pulled out. And they contacted White Magazine and said, we're pulling our money, we're pulling our ads. White Magazine closed down. Uh, they don't exist anymore. And they closed down, wait for it, because they did nothing. They did nothing. But an activist thought, you know what, I think they have an aberrant belief. Get them out of here. And that's exactly what happened. So do you know what? It's no longer even good enough to be quiet because it's the belief that's the problem. And so you see the boycott. This is the condition that we're seeing more and more in Australia. And of course, the latest example of this has been Israel Folau, the highest profile example of this. And we've gotten in behind that with both guns going, uh, because of the principle at play, because of what we're seeing more and more, which is that if people want to tell the truth, or they want to live consistent with their faith, or they want to have a different opinion from that narrow band of political correctness, it's open season. They face legal ramifications. Think of what happened to Israel. He wasn't just fired, he was banned for life, from the two sporting codes that he's played since he was a teenager with no other relevant qualifications. 
Uh, and then, of course, his church was targeted, then his dad was targeted, then his GoFundMe was targeted. Lies have persisted about him in the media in an unbelievable way for a very long time, to the extent that they're still being repeated. Oh, well, he promised to be a good boy and it was in his contract. Nope, never happened. Um, oh, look, this is just a contract law issue. It's not a discrete. No, it's not. Uh, and so on and so on. And then, of course, they targeted his wife. Uh, they won't give up. And this is what happens now to people who don't tow the line. Um, the reason I started my talk the way that I did is because really, at its guts, I don't think we can get around the moral issue here. Which is what? The simple fact is, none of these people did anything wrong. But they are being treated and punished as wrongdoers. What did Joshua do? Salt and light, command of Jesus, right? What did Patricia do? Use the gifts and talents as best she could to serve God, to do the right thing, punish for it. Uh, we've got street preachers and pastors and priests also. What are they doing? Simply trying to declare the gospel and all the rest of it to all nations, punish for it. Um, this is the sort of thing that we can expect. Um, or indeed... Kathy Club, another lady at the High Court of Australia, every Attorney General in Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia, Northern Territory, ACT, Commonwealth, Western Australia, Tasmania, a huge legal case. Why? She gave a piece of paper to a woman who was approaching an abortion clinic that had a simple comment on it that help was available if she needed it. Punished as a wrongdoer. A woman who, through her pro-life ministry, has seen more than 300 babies born alive as a result of her specific offer of help to women walking towards an abortion clinic. And the stories coming out of that ministry are unbelievable. I mean, I'm not a crier, but I read the letters from these mums with pictures of their babies and I came very close, let me tell you. Unbelievable stories. She gives them safe haven from domestic violence. She goes and gives them supplies to look after the child. She'll come around and show them how to raise it. She'll do whatever it takes in their time of need. And Kathy is now a criminal with a criminal conviction who can't get insurance on her house, who can't... All this stuff. Why? Well, in her language, she said, I'm an apostle of God's mercy. I'm someone who brings the mercy of Christ to women in need. Remarkable thing to do. For years and nobody knew about her until she <laughs> was made an example of and taken to the High Court of Australia. Did nothing wrong, punished as a wrongdoer. And you know, this demands a response. It demands a response. And I want to finish by simply saying a couple of things. And these are a couple of things that uh, I think would lift us up from off the floor. A little bit. I don't know if Bob wants me to do that. I think Bob wants you on the floor so that he can, you know, use the moment. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I'll say this, as a Christian, um, this isn't all bad. There's opportunity in this. As a Christian, I say that because Jesus thought about it before I did, and he thought about it before we did. Um, do you know, we're on the floor a little bit, and we're down, and we're sort of really concerned... But when Jesus talked about this, for example, um, in Matthew 5, uh, when he talked about the idea of being persecuted, uh, the idea of being reviled, so angry, disgusted at you for what you believe, we talked about, you know, false things being said against you uh, for, for, the, for, for doing right, uh, whether it is that you're a criminal or whether it is that you're making an unsafe home or whatever. When he talked about that, he actually used the word blessed. He said, blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs. He actually starts on a positive note, not a negative note. And I think he starts on a positive note for, two, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, that's a promise of God. He doesn't say, psych yourself up sufficiently and you'll feel blessed. Uh, he says, no, no, you are. That's a truth in that. But, you know, he goes on to say, effectively, um, well, he, there's something you see in the New Testament when you read it that is very remarkable. I used to think that Paul and Silas were, were, were half crazy for singing hymns in jail all night. Uh, I used to think that the apostles must have been slightly mental to push on against the odds. When you've got the old anti-discrimination tribunal, I call it, the, the Sanhedrin, hauling them in, 
and saying, stop, you know, you're doing a bit of hate speech, gentlemen. Stop speaking in this name. Uh, and then giving them lashes and sending them off. And what do they do? They rejoice and celebrate and keep on going and change absolutely nothing. And I go, they're crazy, crazy men. You know, I'm not so sure, having seen a lot of this now uh, in my work, there isn't a single person who we've helped legally, or maybe one out of all of the people that we've helped legally, uh, they say they're glad it happened. They say, actually, through the trial, through the difficulty that that was, they learned something. And there was something that God taught them and showed them that they otherwise could never have known apart from that experience. And I believe that's why, throughout the New Testament, what is it? Rejoice in trials, blessed are the persecuted, and so on and so on. That's not from us, that's from God. I believe that. But, you know, people will say to me, ah, yeah, but you know what? Um, you've got a persecution complex, no one's getting fed to the lions, it's not that bad. Listen, as I said before, Jesus defines his terms. He says, blessed are you when you're reviled, when you're angry, disgust. We talked about Margaret Court before, what was the angry disgust against her? Get her name off that arena. Uh, you know, Israel, fill out all the lies, people speak falsely against you. He is thinking, firstly, of these sorts of circumstances, right up to, yes, being fed to the lions, I'm sure, and I don't mean for a second to take away from the suffering of some Christians. But then people turn around and they say, oh, yeah, but you know what, here's the thing. It's because you're not winsome and nuanced. If you were just really careful about the way you spoke and you just found that magic formula of words that you could use people would be fine with it you know if Israel had defined his terms very acutely to say well actually homosexual orientation isn't the thing it's only homosexual conduct and homosexual conduct is sinful but sin doesn't necessarily send you to hell it's rejection of Christ that sends you to hell and, blah. and he gave all this theology in his Instagram post. no I'm sorry it wouldn't have been good enough you really think that would have helped him probably would have made it worse um, no Jesus says for righteousness sake there is something about the world at times where actually it is the truth that attracts the hostility and yes be wise yes be careful yes say it the best way you know how but don't be surprised when it's not good enough for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you and I'm not going to walk up to Isaiah in heaven and say listen mate if you'd just been a bit more winsome and nuanced um, you wouldn't have got sawn in half in a hollow log no not good enough, right? And so we can expect it. But let me close with these two points. There's an answer, and one is to be salt and one is to be light. And I think that this is a really important thing for us to recover. One of the things we do often when the pressure is on is we, we roll over or we allow the pressure to change us. Do you know, salt loses its taste, as Jesus says in this particular passage, when when the moisture gets in, when the environment in which it's sitting gets to it, compromises it. And you know, we do mould ourselves and shape ourselves by the demands of the world in which we live. Do you know that the apostles could have walked out of the anti-discrimination tribunal and they could have changed what they were doing to fit the fancies of that tribunal? And we do that. We get an angry legal letter from the relevant authority and we have a strategy meeting and we change things. But they knew they couldn't. They said, we have to obey God rather than men in these moments. Also, as Christian people, we just are not clear and proud of what we believe. We don't really declare the truth about who we are. We hide. But, you know, here's the thing about the salt. The difference makes the difference. And if we're not clearly different, we will not have that influence that the salt has merely by being there, okay? And it's vitally important that amidst the pressure, we don't fold, we don't compromise, we stand firm. Because that example will have a tremendous impact on the world around us. And then he turns around and says, but also light. What is it about light? Well, light's not just being light is doing it's those acts that are seen by others that make a difference and you know I mentioned before we're so tempted to change we're so tempted to mold ourselves we're so tempted to hide you know to before I took this job I didn't realize how I got away with it do you know in Australia what's the first thing people ask what do you do 
Oh, I'm a lobbyist. Oh, yeah? Who do you lobby for? Eh, the strange just lobby. What do you do? Uh, <laughs> You can't get away with it anymore. I did my master's at the Australian National University, which is a particularly not the right environment for this kind of thing. I had people physically recoil when I said that to them. Um, it changed everything, and I thought, you know what, I've been hiding in plain sight. I really have. And that's not good enough, because when the light's under a basket, it does nothing. It's no good. And they did a survey in Australia a while ago and they asked people, do you know someone from this group or with that, you know, the different types of people? And it turns out that the average Australian claims to know an LGBT person more often than they claim to know a Christian person. That's not possible. Statistically not possible. What's the difference? One has the light on, although I don't think it's light, the other one doesn't. They're seen for who they are. And you know, there's things we can do in this community that make a difference and shine the light in the dark place. And public policy is a dark place right now. The legal frameworks are a dark place right now. And if we're shining the light in those places, we are doing a good thing. And we're doing something that needs to be done. But see, it's not that that light has to be out and we're, we withdraw and we do nothing. That light actually has to be on a lampstand to give light to all the house. That's better, right? That some people see it. But here's the challenge to me and the thing that really gets me. Jesus then says, no, no, there's something even better. If it's a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And I ask myself, what on earth am I doing that, that, that is that obvious? That is not unseen by the people who encounter me in my life. And here's the thing, Christian or not, it is by doing those things that the light can be shone in places right now that are very dark. And I give these stories, I sound these warnings, I talk a bit about what's really going on in the moral compass uh, when we get to the guts of it. Because the call is, let's do something. Let's not only be uncompromised and make sure we don't fall for this, but let's actually get up, do things and actually shine the light. And uh, for those of us who are Christians, there's a little promise at the end. And Jesus finishes by simply saying, people will see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Now, what's happened? At the start, it was all persecution, reviling, we're being pushed into a corner. But what's happened now? It's turned all around and we're going the other way and people are seeing good works and glorifying God. And people often say to me, particularly in strictly evangelical churches, they say, oh, all we do is talk about Jesus. And firstly, I say, well, you don't. Tell me how many people you talked about Jesus with today. But secondly, that's not the only way that God works. God works through the testimony of his people who are salt and who are light. And that is part of what we're called to do in this world. Thank you very much. Oh.